So, hi, everyone. I'm David, and today I'm going to talk about uh, time varying network inference with a method that we present here called the time varying graphical lasso. And this is joint work with Young Suk Park, Stephen Boyd, and Yuri Leskovich. So in this day and age, all sorts of applications are generating large amounts of time series multivariate data. So these, these observations come from sensors, but these sensors can refer to a variety of different things. They can be physical sensors like uh, electronics in a car that are measuring the velocity of the car, the angle of the road, the distance to the car in front of you, or they can be more representational or metaphorical sensors. So you can think of the stock market or financial markets where a stock is a, is a quote unquote sensor measuring the, the health or the, the viability of a company and these sensors are recording data in that the stock prices change and they fluctuate uh, across a day. And all, all of these times you're generating large amounts of data uh, that is changing and evolving over time. And it's multivariate and it's coming in really quickly. So th there's a lot of, of challenges in dealing with this data. It's very high dimensional in that you'll often have a lot of sensors. It's unlabeled in that you don't really know what you're seeing. There's not uh, someone hand labeling telling you where there are anomalies, where there are breakpoints, where there's interesting regions. It's high velocity in that it it comes in it, in a streaming setting often very quickly and often you need to update your models, whatever models you do, very, very quickly to incorporate new data before the next readings come in. It's dynamic in that it evolves over time. And it's heterogeneous in that often it comes from a variety of different sources in uh, across various domains or applications. So the challenge here is you need a method of, or methods of learning interpretable structure in an unsupervised way. So the two challenges here, as I said, are it's un, unsupervised and unlabeled, so you can't have a domain expert every time coming in and telling you exactly what you need to learn and where. And you need to interpret it in that there's so much data, you, you, can't, really, uh, you, you can't really look at it by hand or eyeball it and tell what to do. So whatever algorithms you develop need to be scalable in the, the size that they can they scale and the amount of data they can incorporate and robust in the sense that they, they shouldn't be fine-tuned for one specific problem or one specific application, because that really limits the effectiveness of the algorithm. So one way to encode structure that, that we're going to leverage in our, in our talk here is the idea of networks. So there's a lot of types of networks here. This is the graph session, so you can talk about social networks, you can talk about transportation networks, or you can talk about more representational networks here. So this type of network that I'm talking about is known as a Markov random field. And these types of networks show correlations between different entities, in this case, between different sensors. They could be stocks, they could be sensors in a car, correlations between them over time. And in particular, what Markov random fields show are conditional dependencies and conditional independencies between different entities. So if there's a lack of an edge between any two nodes or between any two sensors, that means that given the remaining readings in the time series, these two sensor values are considered conditionally independent of each other. This is a really useful piece of structure that lets you understand and interpret these, and we'll, we'll see how you can interpret them in a little bit. But the key here is that you have a network, but across a time series, these correlation structures, these net correlation networks evolve over time. And there's not just one type of network evolution. You can think of networks or correlation structures or time series where there's global restructuring occasionally. So the network remains constant and then all of a sudden some event or some action happens that causes the entire system to change and restructure. You might have just a single node rewiring all of its edges, changing its location within the network, but leaving the rest of the network unperturbed. So this is more of a local shift. You can have networks that are just smoothly varying over time, or even just have only one or two edges changing at any given timestamp in the entire time series. So whatever methods you need to learn, you want to learn these networks, but you don't want to learn just one type of network evolution. There's no, there's no one type. There are many types of ways networks can evolve. So you need to uncover different types of evolutionary patterns in these time-varying networks. So this is where our work comes in. Our, our method is called the Time Varying Graphical Lasso, or the TVGL, and it takes in a sequence of time-stamped observations, uh, sensor data coming from anything from an automobile to the stock market, and what it does is it predicts a sequence of network slices 
or temporal snapshots of the graph whenever you get a reading. So what it shows is at any given point, it can show what it estimates is the correlation structure between the sensors at that specific point in time. Now what does it look like? It looks something like this. This is a small toy example here where you're given three sensors and a time series where you, where you uh, receive occasional observations of data. And what you're trying to do from this is you want to understand the correlation structure between the different sensors across time. So here what we're doing is we're learning these three networks. Um, you can see them here. Uh, the first one says, look, from time zero to time A, there's an edge between X2 and X3. This is sort of a toy example here. But this says X2 and X3 are correlated that th sort of their readings are affecting each other, you can call it. And then at time A, there's a break point, a sudden shift in the network, where all of a sudden the correlation structure between the different sensors shifts. From there, you get a new network from time A to time B. And then similarly, there's another shift at time B. So what our method does is it takes in this multivariate time series and it returns two things. One is the time varying networks, which shows the snapshots, which here says it's that first network from every point from zero to A, and then that the new network from every point from A to B. And the second thing it does is it identifies regions of interest. So for example, here we are learning, look, not only is this the network at the beginning and this the network in the middle, but at time A in particular is where this network shifted is where some event occurred to cause some sort of correlation structure shift in the time series data. So what we did here was we proposed a method called the TVGL or time varying graphical lasso of learning time varying networks from multivariate time stamped observations. The next thing we did is we developed a scalable algorithm because this is a very computationally difficult task. So we develop a scalable algorithm and implement it in a high performance and open source solver that you can download now. Uh, then finally, we show how to encode different types of temporal evolutions or temporal de dependencies. And then we derive closed form updates within our algorithm for learning these common evolutionary structures. And then finally, we look at a couple uh, examples and case studies to see how you can apply this work to real world data sets. Uh, briefly, in terms of related work, the idea of learning static networks from raw data is, has been well studied. Uh, there's a method known as the graphical lasso, which is learning a static network. And then within network analysis, there's a lot of link prediction based on understanding virality of viral videos, of spreading of viruses in the human interaction network. But what we're looking at is these static networks and how they evolve over time. And we actually leverage ideas from this uh, from joint learning of multiple models simultaneously, as we'll get to in a minute, then how we actually solve this TVGL problem, because it gets very computationally expensive, is we use a splitting and decomposition algorithm based on the alternating direction method of multipliers. So formally, what we're doing is we're taking, uh, we're receiving data, and we're assuming it comes from a distribution with a time-varying covariance matrix, sigma of t. And we observe samples at, from times t1 to tt, and what we want to do is we want to estimate a sequence of sparse inverse covariances, one at each timestamp where we receive an observation. Why sparse inverse covariances? Because these are a well-known way for defining Markov random fields. That is, if the ijth element of the inverse covariance at time t is zero, then at that time, given all the other readings, i and j are conditionally independent at that time. So our problem looks exactly like this, where we're trying to achieve three goals at the same time. What we're doing is, as I said, we're solving for a series of snapshots of these inverse covariances or of these Markov random fields. So the first thing we want to do is to match the empirical data. We want our estimated network to be well supported by the observational data. The second thing we want is sparsity in the network, which provides interpretability, lets us interpret these networks, and also prevents overfitting, because without a sparsity penalty, any type of time varying network or any, any type of network from data would be fully connected or near fully connected due to any sort of noise in the reading. And finally is this idea of temporal consistency. We're learning this network as it evolves over time. So what we can do is we can limit how it can change, how it can evolve by penalizing deviations in the network across adjacent timestamps. And you can see here by this penalty function, uh, different types of penalty functions, as we'll uh, look in the, on the next slide, can enforce different types of temporal consistency or encourage different types of temporal evolutions over time. 
So as I said, this, this penalty function here allows us to model all different types of time-varying networks in the same exact framework. So uh, in this paper, we analyze five in particular. Uh, as you can see here, there's a couple edges changing. There are these occasional but rare global restructurings, smoothly varying over time, blockwise restructuring, and then this idea of perturbed node, where it's a local shift where something happens to a single node, but nothing else in the network changes. So each of these you can model with a different penalty function, and each of these penalty functions encourages a, uh, sort of the, it reveals or uncovers the, these specific types of evolutions and allows you to find within the same framework, within the same model, different types of temporal evolutions uh, across time in this time varying network. So how do we solve it? As I said, we're solving for a series of snapshots of Markov random fields that are all coupled together. So it's actually a very computationally expensive problem. There are a lot of unknown variables and centralized interior point solvers cannot scale. So how we do this is we split the problem up into a series of subproblems, and it can almost be visualized as a chain graph here, where what you have is each snapshot is its own node in the chain graph, and you're solving for your own local optimization, which is your own network just from one observational piece of data, but then you couple the adjacent snapshots together with a temporal consistency penalty, and once it's on this chain graph, you can use distributed optimization over graphs known as a method, uh, using a method known as ADMM or the alternating direction of multipliers to solve this in a distributed way. So the trick of ADMM is that there's no global coordination, there's no, uh, there's no centralized solver anywhere. It's a distributed algorithm where each local node solves its own subproblem, does a message passing algorithm to its neighbors in time here, and then it converges very quickly to the globally optimal solution because this is a convex problem. Then another thing we do in our paper is that we derive closed form ADMM solutions for all subproblems in our TVGL algorithm, including for each of the different penalty types. So you can quickly in incorporate and swap in and swap out all different types of evolutionary structures that you're looking for. So as I said, this sort of time series data often comes in and it's very high velocity. So what you need to do very often is update your model, incorporate new data as it continues to arrive in a streaming fashion. So we, in our paper as well, we develop a warm start ADMM algorithm uh, that is best used in streaming settings where you don't want, whenever you get a new reading, to have to resolve your entire time varying network inference problem. We derive and develop a warm start ADMM algorithm to quickly incorporate new data, uh, which can be deployed in real world streaming settings. So, we implemented our TVGL solver. It's available online here, and I'll uh, share a link to that at the end of the talk as well. And here I'm gonna look at a, a couple real world applications to show how finding this type of network, uh, network structure and the evolution of this structure over time can actually be really useful in real world applications. So first, in terms of scalability, our TVGL algorithm can solve for uh, millions of variables in minutes. So here we solve for 5 million variables in I think under 10 minutes. And centralized solvers, so the two centralized solvers we compare against, and a naive ADMM without any of the closed form solutions that we derive, they explode computationally. They're cubic in the problem size and they're, they can't really scale beyond a few thousand unknown variables. And we can solve for millions very easily, even up to hundreds of millions. Now let's look at a couple case studies though. As I mentioned at the beginning, stock prices are can be viewed as sensors, uh, measuring the health of the company and sort of showing across time how a certain company is performing. But additionally, all these stock prices are correlated in a certain way. So you can learn these networks to figure out which stock prices, which companies are correlated and affect other companies. Maybe when Apple goes up today, that means Tesla is going down. Or if two competitors, or if two complementary goods, maybe both of them go up or both of them go down. So the data set we look at here is daily stock prices of several large companies in early 2010. And what we do here is we treat the closing price of each stock as a daily sensor observation. So here we're just taking one sensor per day, one reading per day, and we run TVGL to understand how the different stocks are correlated with each other. So first off, the idea of static network inference, as I mentioned, is a well-defined thing. But we run TVGL, and we take, for example, a snapshot of the network, and it looks something like this. And this is actually quite useful. You can see the, uh, the different tech companies are all related to each other. They all affect each other in a very strong way. And then here is actually a really interesting thing, where you have Boeing and FedEx. 
both being connected to Amazon but not being connected to each other. Now, Boeing and FedEx, in terms of raw correlations, are actually very correlated in that both stocks go up or both stocks go down on a given day. That's likely due to the fact that they're both somewhat in the transportation industry. However, if you notice, Boeing and FedEx, their stock prices, what our, our method discovers is that their stock prices are conditionally independent given Amazon stock price, possibly because they depend so much of, of, on their business from Amazon. So what this is saying is when Amazon goes up, both of them go up. When Amazon goes down, both of them go down. But conditional on Amazon stock price, Boeing and FedEx's stock prices are conditionally independent of each other. So this is cool, but this is just a static snapshot of the graph. This conditional independency actually holds true throughout the entire time series. But what other useful things can you find in the evolutionary structures of the time series? So we looked at this perturbed node penalty. It's this idea of a local shift. It's when a single node rewires all of its edges, but the rest of the network stays exactly the same. So we ran uh, TVGL with a perturbed node, and if you look, we plot here the perturbed node deviation across time, and we see that at one point there's a giant deviation. So it's the last week of January. There's this giant deviation in the perturbed node, which says a single stock rewired its entire network, and then there are a couple edges rewiring here and there the rest of the time, but there's this one timestamp where a single stock rewired its entire local network without affecting the rest of the graph. So we plot that with a few key stocks here and see which, which edges changed, which edges went up and down and, and disappeared and came in. We see that it's all of Apple's edges. The gray ones here are the edges that changed. So what we notice is using this perturbed node penalty, here we're looking at a three or four month interval, and there's one event that caused Apple's stock at the end of January to shift in correlation with the rest of the network. Now what could that have been? A quick Google search just shows you that uh, it was actually the very day that Apple announced that they were making the first iPad, the original iPad. So as soon as Apple announced they were making the iPad, and this we learned in a purely unsupervised way, its local correlation structure with all of the other stocks in the S&P 500 changed without affecting the rest of the network. The other stocks were all having the same correlation with respect to each other, but Apple's location in the networks, Apple's correlation structure shifted as they were moving from more of a software company to more of a, or more of a uh, desktop and laptop company to more of a mobile company. You can keep looking at this in other types of things. So again, we ran TVGL on every company in the S&P 500, and we looked for a global restructuring, this idea of a global shift that causes the entire network, the entire correlation structure of the whole S&P 500 to shift. And we found, once again, we have a similar plot to the Apple one, that this happens perfectly corresponding with this flash crash on May 6, 2010. So this happened when the stock market crashed, went down 10% in a matter of seconds, then bounced right back up. Uh, it happened to be a couple rogue traders who went to jail. I think they're still in jail for it, actually. And um, you can see the stock market bounced right back up. So what happened was the stock market crashed, then went back up. So our daily sensor observations doesn't see this flash crash. In fact, they just see the end of day price here, which is just down 2% on the day. So they don't notice that the whole market crashed, then went back up. Our, our algorithm just sees, oh, look, we have a reading, and it's given, uh, it, it's showing that the market went down 2%, but that's pretty common. But what happened was the correlation structure of how the different stocks went up and down and fluctuated in relation with each other all shifted on this day. Uh, there's no ground truth way of telling why this happens, but it likely occurred because sort of our, our interpretation is that investors got nervous, investors got spooked, they rebalanced their portfolio, they changed their asset allocations. So the existing status quo shifted on May 6, 2010, and post the flash crash, the entire network correlation structure for the future time after that was a completely different correlation. So one last case study is we looked at automobile sensors, as I said, um, you can take car sensors. This is a real world car data. We took eight different sensors and we took a single turn of data and plotted a time varying network as a driver, a real world driver and a real world uh, road made a turn. And again, this sensor network can be used as a signature to understand driving styles. Maybe some people push the brake harder. Maybe some people, when they're making a turn, turn the wheel earlier, go through the turn faster. And that all reflects itself in this correlation structure between the different sensors. You can even use this to detect if a driver's distracted, drowsy, or even drunk. And what you do is you plot this time-varying network, and you can 
interpret it to differentiate between different drivers, understand driving styles, or even see things like, oh, look, during the turn, the steering wheel angle, for example, is a very important node. It's centrally located within the network, whereas during the straightaways, the steering wheel angle doesn't affect any of the other centers in the time series. So overall, our method's called the Time Varying Graphical Lasso. It's a scalable and computationally tractable way of learning time varying networks from sensor data. Uh, we developed a fast algorithm based on the alternating direction method of multipliers and show how you can encode different types of evolutionary structures in the same framework. And then we applied it to a few different case studies that we talked about here. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions and thanks for listening.